Sounds great. All right. So my name is Caitlin. Just like she said, I'm the naturalist from Dubuque County Conservation Board. So just to fresh up the term naturalist, when most people think of the term naturalist, they think, all right, somebody who eats nuts and berries and lives in a tree house and all the other various weird things that granola crunchy people do. Yeah, there are some naturalists that are like that. I know a little bit about a lot of things, but not really a lot about any particular thing. So I by no means am an expert, but I know enough to be dangerous about most of the things. Birding and backyard birding is one of those things. So I'm gonna walk you through a PowerPoint that I've created. Uh, if you were in person, I would be showing you a bunch of different bird feeders and a bunch of different animal mounts. But since we're all in Zoom land now, I kind of have a different system that I'm gonna walk you through. If at any point during the presentation you have any questions, feel free to let me know and I would be happy to walk you through it. And if I can't answer the question, I can at least get you uh, in touch with some of the good resources that can. So just an FYI, if you, oh, can I see that marker, can you? Let's try a different one. Let's try yellow. This is my email. So it's caitlin.moler at Dubuque County dot US. So if at any point um, you think you have a question, but you don't want to share in front of the group or you need something for later, I should be able to help you out through that as well. Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. So hopefully you can all see my PowerPoint. Again, if you can't, just let me know and maybe I can help walk you through it a bit more too. So the View County Conservation Board manages just over 2,800 acres of public land. So on this map, all the light yellow spots are all the areas that we manage. So we manage like the Heritage Trail and Massey Marina, Mud Lake, Swiss Valley, Whitewater Canyon. Some of those big county, um, some of those bigger parks are more of our well-known areas, but my headquarters where I'm located out of most often is the Swiss Valley Nature Center. And the Swiss Valley Nature Center has some really great bird feeder viewing areas. So if you're ever looking to just see what a bird feeding area looks like, you're more than welcome to stop out at Swiss Valley and check out ours. Uh, we've just redid ours in the last couple of years and it's very, very popular with lots of species of birds. So bird feeding, uh, nearly 60 million Americans feed wild birds. That was according to a study in 2016, so it's probably even higher now. And they estimate that $4 billion worth of bird seed and $1 billion worth of feeders and nest boxes are bought each year. So bird feeding is a very, very popular form of outdoor enthusiasts to get involved in, and it's relatively inexpensive and it's pretty easy to get into. Just for starters, just right away when you think of an area, you wanna consider uh, the different habitats that are in your yard because wildlife show preferences for certain types of habitat. So think about what you currently have in your yard. Do you have lots of trees or is it just 100% turf grass or are you in downtown, let's say Dubuque and you have a lot of cement around you. The wildlife that you will attract will depend not only on the type of habitat in your yard, but also the surrounding habitat. So what might be close to you? Maybe you don't have a lot of trees, but maybe your neighbor does. Every species of wildlife has its own requirement, which can vary with its age or the season, depending on what resources are available. There are several different types of food that can easily be provided in your backyard habitat that can attract wildlife to you. One of them that most people overlook, which we'll go into more detail, is water. Water is pretty essential for wildlife and should be provided year round if possible. Most wildlife would prefer like a running water or like a river or a creek, but if you don't have that, standing water sources such as small ponds um, or bird baths are acceptable too. Also wildlife prefer shelter and cover. So maybe you don't have anything in your yard and you put up a bird feeder and you're super bummed because nothing's coming. It could be because the animal doesn't feel comfortable enough exposing themselves in your yard. So maybe you need to consider creating more shelter or cover that'll encourage them to come to your yard and breed or nest. And those dense vegetation, such as vines and shrubs and larger conifer trees, which are uh, like pine trees, that can maybe help to make them feel more competent and comfortable. 
The next thing you're going to want to do is you're basically going to want to send out the invite and tell everybody to come to your yard. So what that means is you basically have to convince them to come to your yard because, like I said, they're not naturally attracted to turf grass. They're great guests once they get there because their songs are pretty, their colors are beautiful, and they're full of lots of lively activities. Another thing is if you convince the wildlife to come to your yard, it might be able to help you get rid of some of those pets that you don't want. It might be able to help you control some of those insects, uh, like those European uh, or an Asian beetles that are very, very harmful to like raspberry plants. There are birds that specialize in eating some of those plants. The best way to invite those birds to your backyard is basically to provide the food like any party. This is kind of a, a, a bigger graphic, but it's just to give you an overview of some of the components. So if you would think of yourself as a tiny little square in the inside of this big circle, these are 16 of the basic landscape components that fulfill the major habitat needs for our wildlife. So eight of those are components that are structural or non-living components. And the other, <laughs> the other eight are actual, whoops, sorry. The other eight are the actual uh, vegetative components of your yard. Uh, the next thing you'll wanna do is try to create a varied pattern in your vegetation. So by intermingling the species and the sizes and the shapes, again, to try to mimic what a, a natural setting would look like, you wanna try to recreate that in your yard. Give birds a choice of places for their activities, maybe a place like the tall crowns of the trees so they can roost, or maybe down low uh, by the growing flowers and grasses where they can consume insects. You wanna give them a choice of food services. So things like seeds and nuts, fruit, berries, flower, nectar, Many songbirds actually combine these different plant food sources into their diet. Sometimes they even bring in insects and worms and spiders. The other thing you'd wanna consider is uh, those edges. So right, let's say where you have the timber meeting your turf grass, you wanna try to feather them in. So they don't really like just hard straight edges. They want like a zigzag form. So if you could create bushes where you put them not in a straight perfect row, but a little bit un, Uniform, that's generally what wildlife like to see because again, that mimics what they would see in a natural setting. This is a smaller graphic, but if you need any suggestions anytime on what type of native vegetation to bring into your yard, a really great resource is uh, Trees Forever. It provides an excellent list of the trees and shrubs that uh, provide benefits to both pollinators and birds throughout the season. So I just took a small screenshot. This document's probably eight pages long and it shows the species that are actually native to Iowa, the species that were forever found here. So when you see this graphic, you can actually see the common name, the scientific name, when it blooms, what type of habitat it prefers to grow in. This would be a really great resource to consult when considering what to maybe bring and grow into your yard. So I wanted to take a little bit time to describe a little bit more about what native means. Oh, sorry. All right. Sorry. <clears throat> so a native species is something that occurs naturally in Iowa. So most landscape plants uh, are shipped from out of the county or sometimes even out of the country to Iowa every spring. Native plants are the plants that are best adapted to Iowa's extreme weather. So maybe they're okay with the amount of salt that we put on our roads to drive to and from in the winter. They're plants that have literally evolved to be high functioning in the state of Iowa. <laughs> so they're used to our pests, they're used to our diseases, and they can resist them better. An example of how this can go wrong if you introduce a non-native species is in the bottom left of this screen. That's a bird known as a European starling, and most of you might know what that is. If you don't, let me tell you a quick story. So that bird right there is a bird that we actually introduced into the United States. The reason being because we felt like the birds that people talk about when they think about Shakespeare, they should probably be in Iowa too. They should probably be in the US. So we literally went and got them from Europe. In 1890, we introduced 60 of them into Central Park in New York City and their populations have exploded. Little did we know that a short 60 years later, they would make it all the way across the Pacific and be everywhere. And this species is bad because it outcompetes native species that are known to live in North America. Their presence has had an incredible impact on the native species in our landscape. 
So what I'm trying to tell you is it is great to plant vegetation in your yard, but when you do it, you really, really, really should consider just going native because again, those are the type of plants that are supposed to be here. Those are the plants that thrive in our setting and they're not out competing or pushing out another native species. Our birds that are from Iowa are most used to and adapted to those plants. If you put in a different plant, it might, it might actually help an invasive species like a European starling thrive. If you put in a non-native plant, they might be more used to it than our native birds. So native is a good thing to consider. This is an example of what a little bit, a little tiny patch of a native yard could look like. So it's got great curb appeal. It, this native little pocket prairie is, helps with water issues. It attracts wildlife. It provides lots of color throughout the seasons. It has nectar, host sites for butterflies, nectar for hummingbirds, shelter for ground nesting birds, and then seeds for seed eating birds. So you can see that you can make a native garden look intentional and you can make it have borders and you can use mulching just by using native plants. You can make it look intentional, but it is more of a, a wild look, but it has tons of benefits. One more story about the natives and then we can continue back onto some of the birds, but this is, this is the crucial element to having a really strong bird area in your yard is to start with the, the cover and the plant material. So one example really quick is, and you might have this in your yard, if you, if you don't think you do, I bet you can walk out and in your surrounding neighborhood, I bet you'll find this plant. This one on the right is called bush honeysuckle and it is loved by birds, but it takes over and it crowds out the natives basically out competing anything else. So birds like it, but in liking it, nothing else can grow around it. So the native shrubs like the dogwoods and the verbenums can't grow because this brush honeysuckle takes over. And how you know it's a non-native honeysuckle is when you walk up to it and you snap the branch, it's hollow like a straw. If I were to cut this bush down today, which again is a bush that's non-native, we brought it from Europe because we thought, okay, if I plant this between my yard and your yard, I'm not gonna be able to see you. Yes, true, it's one of the first to green up in the spring and one of the last to drop its leaves in the fall. If I cut it down today, it'll say, eh, that barely even hurt. And it'll stump sprout a brand new plant right from its stump and continue growing. So this bush honeysuckle, again, has outcompeted most of our natives and even scarier, the research, the most recent research is cedar waxwings. And if you don't know what cedar waxwings are, they're probably one of my favorite birds. They're very, very pretty. They have tiny little yellow tipped um, tail feathers. From them eating so much of the bush honeysuckle, it's literally changed the color formation of their feathers. Instead of being yellow, now some of the cedar waxwings uh, feathers are turning orange. And that might not seem like a big deal to you, but it is very, very harmful because the color of the plumage of a bird is pretty much like the badge of honor. It's a badge of gender in their case because some cedar waxwings, the red, red have, cedar waxwing males have red and females have yellow. And if you change the coloration of their feathers, it can be um, messed up for species recognition. They might not recognize which one's a male and which one's a female. And this could have huge serious impacts on that bird population. So changing gears a little bit, we talked about the, the importance of the vegetation and why that habitat component is probably the most crucial important factor of a bird feeding area. Again, this is kind of a smaller chart, which I apologize, but it walks you through a lot of the bird seeds and the birds that prefer them and the type of bird feeder to consider. These are the types that I would recommend. Uh, in, you might, looking at this picture, you might have some of them. Great if you do. The most in popular ones are the hopper feeders. Uh, and they are, let's see, the, it's got the green roof and it's got the cardinal on it and the brown sides. Um, that attracts both large and small birds. It can be hung on a post or mounted. It's good all around bird feeder. If you were to get one bird feeder, I would recommend getting a hopper feeder. The next one is the seed tube bird feeder. And that's the one that also has, also has a cardinal on it. It's the one on the far left. Um, that's good for attracting smaller birds and birds that typically cling onto stuff, uh, like nuthatches cling onto stuff. The other one to consider is a platform feeder or a ground feeder. So that's the one with the, the yellow roof there. Um, and platform feeders can look very different. They can be just a big, big rectangle with a piece of screen under it with bird uh, seed on top. Um, but those are good at attracting lots and lots of birds because they're so versatile. 
both large and small birds can just jump on that platform. The other one is suet. Uh, suet is not just a winter product. Most people think, oh, it's just something that I should feed in the winter time. But it's not really true anymore because they make suet that doesn't melt. So it's no melt suet that you can feed all year round. 30% more suet is actually con consumed between March and late August than all winter long. So suet is just as important in the winter. Uh, the other last one is the, the popular um, nectar feeder. So that one is good for like Baltimore Oreos or Red Starts or Hummingbirds. Um, the thing that you want to consider when you have your nectar feeder is that it's actually not good to make red dye anymore. It's harmful to the hummingbirds. So when you can make this, you can literally just make it with sugar and water. It can be 100% clear and the hummingbirds will prefer it just the same. So something else to consider is the type of bird seed that you add into your feeders. So if I were to again have one bird feeder, it would be a hopper feeder. And the seed that I would say would be the best, most strongest seed would be the black oil sunflower seed. It is preferred by many small feeder birds, especially in the Northern latitudes where we are. Striped sunflower is another type of seed that can be readily eaten, especially by those larger beaked birds or even hulled sunflower seed is eaten by even the greater variety of birds. But you can get black oil sunflower seed from almost any hardware store. That one, the most birds prefer the black oil sunflower seed. It's one of the most popular for the birds. The next one uh, in the top right is called millet. So white millet is another favorite of smaller beaked birds. It attracts things like quails and doves and juncos and sparrows, sometimes cowbirds or red-winged blackbirds. Another one that you could consider, which is a little bit more expensive, is cracked corn. Uh, medium cracked corn can attract many types of ground feeding birds. But the only kicker is it's, pr it's prone to rot a little bit quicker. Since it's cracked corn, the insides are exposed to the elements. So if you decide to do corn, you're, you'd have to monitor it to make sure that it's not um, molding before your birds consume it. The other one, which you may have heard of, it's a little, little less common, is uh, safflower seed and is preferred by pretty birds that are uh, like the cardinals and the gross beaks. Um, but sometimes the squirrels can find this one too. Um, they prefer this one as well. If you were to go versus sunflower seed or safflower, safflower seed, most birds still would pick the sunflower seed over the safflower seed. The other one is Niger, sometimes referred to as thistle. It's a preferred food of goldfinches um, and house finches. Oops, sorry. Screen's getting away from me. All right, um, so that's sometimes referred to as black gold though because of all of the seeds. Niger and thistle are typically tend to be more of the more expensive seed and it rots a lot quicker. So when you fill up your thistle feeder, unless you have a really active population of goldfinches, I would consider only filling it halfway full um, because it, like I said, it can kind of get old quickly and it is more of an expensive seed. And then the last one is suet. And you can make suet with like uh, animal lard if you want to or peanut butter but it's not very expensive and you can get the no melt suet cakes now at most hardware stores. A very fun one, but it's kind of more expensive still is whole peanuts. Uh, whole peanuts, you can get some really, really cool whole peanut feeders and watch the birds try to navigate their way into it. It's preferred by woodpeckers. The one that you wanna watch out for and try to avoid is something that has milo, wheat, or oats in it. So it's like the bottom right one on my screen. So these are agriculture products that are frequently mixed into lower priced seed mixes. And most of the time, the birds just pick through it and discard that stuff, which ultimately leads to an accumulation of it under your feeders, which can sometimes attract in rodents. So if you get a mixed seed, which you could, just make sure to flip the bag over and make sure milo, wheat, and oats either are not in it or are in a very, very small percentage. Because like I said, it's just a filler that's generally a waste and it generally isn't something that the birds actually like to consume anyway. They'll just throw it out. Uh, the other thing, like I said at the beginning, is bird bath or water. Having a water feature of your garden is just as important as having food. And I know that seems funky, but having an open water space, especially in the winter, 
you'll see a whole lot more birds accessing that area because of it. There are solar powered bird baths that basically have heaters in them to keep the water from freezing in the winter time. So it's, it's really good if you have a strong component of having that water available all seasons, all year round. There's lots and lots of different types that you can find. I, at my yard, I just have this one that goes right on my deck and it's just, it's brown and it has the heating element right in the inside. If it's really cold, it does still gel up or sometimes freeze, but it's usually not completely solid, so I can break it up when I feed my birds, um, and it stays open most of the year. I don't like the big deep ones because generally it's little songbirds that are using it that don't want to go super deep into the water. Um, so I do the shallower ones, which again tend to sometimes freeze up a little quicker. But the more expensive you go on those um, bird baths, they're definitely the more fancy they are. Some of them are even little fountains too, which are very cool. If you can get one with a little fountain, it has that movement element. So that running water feature is something again that the birds would prefer, prefer more. But whatever you do, if you do decide to add a bird bath into your uh, bird feeding area, I would recommend at least once a week dumping it and cleaning it out. So anytime you congregate wildlife to a specific area, it is increasing that probability of them transferring diseases. So if they are all touching the same object, just like if you and I have a cold and we touch the same object, we give each other the cold. Same thing with the birds. Uh, if you don't clean your bird feeders, you're enhancing the probability that they could potentially spread a disease. So dumping that bird bath, cleaning it out every so often is a good practice to do. And again, the location is one of the strongest things. So considering where you put your bird feeders so they won't have a chance of getting basically eaten by another bird um, and they feel com comfortable and confident coming into your bird area. So considering service berries and high bush cranberries and arrowwoods, building a good neighborhood essentially for your birds to feel confident and comfortable coming in is the, is the key. So you can't do a bird program without talking about the other animals that sometimes come and join your bird party. Some of them are deer, raccoons, hawks, and squirrels. They're clever and they like diverse habitats. So if you create a diverse habitat in your yard, you're gonna get these other animals as well. If deer are an issue in your yard, there's no such thing as deer proof. And I know people say like, oh, I bought these plants because they're, they're uh, deer proof. What we learned this winter and every other really cold winter, we had that two week cold snap this year and those deer uh, were starving. So they ate the buds on trees. They eat cedar leaves from cedar trees or cedar needles. Uh, they ate bark off of trees because they were starving. So if any animal is hungry in the winter, they're gonna eat what you have. So there's really not much that you can do to make it deer proof. There are plants that are uh, less palatable that they wouldn't prefer right away, like hostas, for instance, are something that they generally don't prefer to run to and eat right away, but they will if they have to. Let's see. Squirrels. Uh, so if you can't beat the squirrels, you basically got to join them and feed them too. Um, we'll go into a little bit more about some of the squirrel methods that um, we've used before and had a bit of success at as well. Raccoons are basically going to get into whatever you have if you leave it out. So meaning don't store things like dog food outside and be sure that if you have bird seed, you're putting it in like a metal garbage bin or something in your garage and keep the door shut. Keeping things securely closed will help you prevent a little bit more raccoon damage. The one that we can't do a whole lot about is predation. So everything's got to eat. So if you attract birds to an area, you're ultimately attracting predators to that area as well. So they thrive with the element of surprise and they'll continue to feed on your songbirds. So what you want to do is you want to mess it up every so often. You want to take your bird feeders and put them down. If you're having a problem with Cooper's hawks, take your bird feeders, put them down for a while, disrupt their patterns. And the only other thing you can do, it's why I spent so much time at the beginning talking about vegetation, is providing cover. Provide a place where those songbirds can feel safe. So you want that cover to be fairly close to your bird feeders, but not too close because of raccoons. But you want to give those birds a, a chance to hide. Um, you want to eliminate that element of surprise quite so much if you have an area for them to just go and hide out at. So back to the squirrels. Uh, the squirrel thing, the thing that you can do, which is most people have success with, is the baffle. So you can see on that picture, there's like this big black tube that goes over it. 
that's one example of a squirrel baffle. There's another one that looks just like a cone that you can put on. If you go the cone method, you want to get one that's like 17 inches in diameter or more. Uh, squirrel can jump 10 feet, 10 feet from the nearest object. So wherever you place your feeders, you want to consider, is it far enough away from the nearest tree or the nearest shrub? Or maybe you want to prune some of your trees so the branches don't lead directly to your feeders. Again, you want to place, place it pretty far from any object they can jump on. The other thing is if you're just having trouble beating them, what you could try to do is basically place a squirrel feeder. So if you can't beat them, again, join them. And what you can do is you can, just like that little tiny picnic table bench one right there, you can create or buy a squirrel feeder and place it farther away from your bird feeder and keep it stocked just like you keep your bird feeder stocked. So you're encouraging those squirrels to consume food too, but stay further away from your bird feeders so your birds can enjoy it their feeders. Again, the, the hawk thing, um, you just want to plant that native shrub or evergreens for providing cover so that birds can hide from the predators. This is another example. Um, this is a sharp-shinned hawk. So Cooper's hawk and sharp-shinned hawks are probably the two most common hawks that go into a bird feeding area and consume them. So you want to think about that native shrubby cover. Here's two examples of pictures on side by side. Cooper's hawk have that noticeable white band on the terminal edges of their tail feathers. In flight, they have kind of a straighter wingspan and curved edges on their tail feathers. <laughs> Another thing that we have happen a lot is birds colliding with windows. So it's estimated that 1 billion birds die every year in bird feeder areas from colliding with glass. So what you can do with this is consider putting your bird feeders further away from your house. But then again, it's harder for you to see the birds. The other thing you can do is put window clings. So window clings are just like the silhouettes of birds. You can make them, you can print them off, cut them out, put them on your windows. So the birds see something and it doesn't just look like a clear window that they can fly right through your house at. If a bird collides with a window, we have this call every year at the Nature Center. The very best thing you can do is if it, if it doesn't seem to be getting out of it and flying away, you can go outside and you can put it in a shoebox, put the bird in a shoebox, close the shoebox, let it sit in a shadier location somewhere away from predators for a little while, check on it and see if it's coming out of it. Sometimes birds can have like a, a mild concussion from the impact of the window. If you let the bird sit there, that's when you usually have issues with predators like possums, strangely enough. Possums will come up and consume a bird or cats will come up and consume a bird. If the bird is not snapping out of it, it is very, very difficult to find a rehabber that's close that can work on birds like that. Uh, if it is a bigger bird, like a raptor, like let's say like an owl or an eagle, you can usually find rap, uh, raptor resource centers that are willing to make the drive to Dubuque to work on an animal, but smaller songbirds, just because there's so many of them, you usually can't find a rehabber close enough to be willing to take on something like that. Uh, the closest rehabber we have is actually an independent, uh, and they are, they're great. Um, Wild Thunder is their name, and sometimes if they have a volunteer out this way, they'll pick up a bird, but that's just something to consider. <laughs> so if you put those window clings up, hopefully you can avoid those collisions altogether. So I talked a little bit about cats. Um, cats kill hundreds of millions of birds annually. So if you have cats, the only thing that I can say is if you wanna have cats and birds, keep your cats indoors or keep your cat on a leash when you go outside. Um, cats like to chase things, especially if a bird hits a window or if you have ground feeding birds, a cat will run up and pounce on it. So if, if you are, considering having a bird feeding area and you have a cat, if you could just keep your cat indoors, you'll have a lot more success with continuing to have big bird populations at your feeders. I described a little bit before about the importance of cleaning your bird bath. Same thing can be said about your bird feeders. Uneaten seed can become soggy and grow uh, a deadly mold inside, which can be passed on from different birds. So if you empty those bird feeders, at a very minimum twice a year, but if you could every two weeks, that would be even better, especially if you have like a really humid summer. 
You can use like a long handled bottle brush and scrub it with a dish detergent, rinse it out with a powerful hose. You could soak it in a bucket with like 10% non-chlorine bleach solution and rinse it out really well and then just let it dry in the sun. And in the early spring, after a heavy winter bird feeding season, it's best if you can rake up the spilled grain and the sunflower hulls, again, to prevent that buildup of mold and the potential attraction to rodents to come into your feeders. Some other fun things that you can consider adding into your landscape. Um, you can do DIY projects like rain barrels. They come in all shapes and sizes, artificial nesting boxes, um, you can provide benches so you can come out and look at it. If you have any questions or want a specific recommendation on bird feeders, we have lots of them. Um, the best book is actually made from Minnesota. It's called Woodworking for Wildlife. If you want to build one yourself. Every year we do a bluebird workshop and we do a, a bat house workshop. So you are more than welcome to join in on any of them that we have at Swiss Valley and create a birdhouse if you want to. The only thing about placing a birdhouse is if you're going to have a birdhouse and not monitor it, then you might as well not have a birdhouse. If you do decide to have a birdhouse, checking it is the best thing you can do. So you can kick out like house sparrows if you don't want them there. Make sure there's no pests getting in like a gnat or wasps, things like that, and cleaning them out every year. For instance, like bluebirds, they don't use the same nest. They'll take out and build a new nest every single time they nest. And you might have four different nests in the same box throughout that year. So keeping an eye on them is a good thing. If you want to look at babies, you can. Uh, it's not recommended that you touch them or anything that, but that old wise tale of like, oh, the bird's going to smell you and then abandon their baby. It doesn't work like that. The only harm you could do is by prematurely causing them to fledge. So after the birds are starting to get their downy feathers off and get their flight feathers, you want to stop opening the box because you don't want to cause them to prematurely jump out and then they're not ready to fly and they hit the ground and they might be consumed by a predator. But during the beginning parts, when they're eggs or when they just hatch, you are more than welcome to peer inside the box. You can count them, you can track that data and see how successful your nesting opportunities are at your house. Um, some birder must haves. This is just a list that we've created um, that we've given out in multiple different events. Uh, you want a pair of binoculars, and binoculars can get really expensive. You don't need them right away. Um, the best one that we recommend is the Nikon Pro Staff 3S. So it's 18 by 42 in magnification, and it's about $120. So it's a good standard beginner pair that's a step up from basically buying a pair at Walmart. But again, they can range to several thousands of dollars. But this Nikon Pro Staff is a great beginner one. The next thing I want to consider is a field guide. So this Peterson field guide, they're nationally known. They're really, really good at creating user-friendly field guides. And if you can get one that's Midwest specific, that'd be even better because there's less birds that you'd have to try to sift through. You could consider creating a life list. So basically what that means is if you get really into birding, a lot of people will start a life list. So they'll print off a list online typical birds in the Midwest, and they'll check off which ones they see. So it becomes like a game, a sport, slightly addictive to try to get more birds on your life, life list, list. Another thing that people have done is by putting either GoPros or trail cameras right up next to your bird feeders. It is really, really fun to see like a, a chickadee or a nuthatch come up with a, a sunflower seed and crack it right in front of your trail camera. And again, you can check it periodically when you feel your bird feeders and bring it inside and uh, look at that footage. So that's something you could do. And then the last thing I would recommend is connecting with a local birder or a local bird club. Dubuque has a very strong Dubuque Audubon Club and they attend multiple events, they host multiple events and they're fantastic birders. So if you wanna get into this a bit more but aren't sure how to start, if you look up Dubuque Audubon Club on Facebook or online, get in touch with their club and then just follow them around on a birding event. It's awesome to see what some of them can do. They can identify birds from sight, sound, um, by the shape and the pattern on how they're flying. So that's a thing to consider as well. Uh, just kind of a nerdy thing, but if you love to read books, like I love to read books and you wanna get inspired by reading, a fantastic book, it's called The Big Year. Uh, this book was actually turned into a movie. It's a great way to introduce the crazy annual competition to see who can get the most birds that they can find in a year. 
trust me, it'll get you thinking on how you can accomplish your own big bird year too. Uh, the other one is uh, to see every bird on earth. It does an excellent job introducing some of the um, things about the birding subculture and also illustrates how bird watching can turn into this obsession. So it's a pretty cool book if you if you like to read books. And there is apps for everything nowadays, but the birding apps that I would recommend you getting are eBird and Merlin Bird app. So they are really, really good at helping you identify or track birds. eBird specifically is one that can help you create your life list. And you can just go in and check off a bird when you see it every year. And it also gives you like hints and tips. So one thing about eBird that sometimes birders hate and sometimes birders love is there'll be like an eBirder, like you can see Caitlin from Swiss Valley. I can maybe see a Solway owl. I could log the Solway owl and I could say where I seen it. So another birder who logs on and wants to see a Solway owl can check out Caitlin's and say, oh, she said there's a Solway owl right now at Swiss Valley. So let's all jump in our cars, drive over and check out this Solway owl. So it's got a little bit of give and take. Sometimes the fantastic birders don't like to share their locations of birding. It's a little bit, like I said, some, some people hate it, some people love it, but either way, it can help you keep track of your life list. The Merlin Bird app is very helpful because it can help you narrow things down by shape, size, coloration, where you're finding it, the tip, uh, its behavior. So if you're not sure what you're looking at and you don't have the field guide handy, but you have the Merlin Bird app, it'll be able to get you pretty close. A thing that I also would recommend is if you do all this work and create this really awesome bird habitat in your yard, you can actually become a scientist by doing citizen science opportunities. So the first one is called the Great Backyard Bird Count. And it's basically a joint effort from new bird watchers to serious life lister birders who can submit everything they see in their backyard. And that typically takes place over three or four days in February. So you can, you can literally Google Great Backyard Bird Count and submit the birds that you're seeing in your yard. It's really fun. The other one is the Hummingbird Journey North. So again, you can Google that and that phrase will pop up. You put your hummingbird feeder out in let's say April, beginning of May, and you watch it. And as soon as you see your first hummingbird, you log on to Hummingbird Journey North and you log it. So scientists can see when the hummingbirds are typically coming through your portion of the state. Another one is Nest Watch. So if you create a cool bird box and you wanna monitor it, you can do that by submitting your data to nestwatch.com. And then the last one is Feeder Watch. Feeder Watch, it used to be free. It might be a smaller subscription now um, where you would monitor your feeders um, once a week all year long. And you would help scientists collect data about what type of birds are in your area, how frequently they're visiting, how high are their numbers, so it's a good thing to kind of get you used to the different birds and then help scientists as well. So any of these projects I've participated in and they're all lots of fun and you can find all information by just Googling them and become a part of uh, being a scientist. So just to review really quick, uh, you wanna observe your current situation, what you have at your house, the resources that are close, consider how you can start creating habitat. Think about the food, the water, the shelter, the space, Again, when doing that, natives are best. Really, really try to get natives. Consider selective feeding using different types of feeders, different seeds to provide lots of different opportunities for many species of birds. And then transition into that landscape gradually. So not straight, perfect rows. Consider zigzagging and making it look more natural. And then you can visit those local businesses like Steve's Ace or Wagner's or Tyson's. And most of them can hook you up with the resources and the tools that you need for your bird seed and your bird feed. And then most importantly, it would be uh, just to have fun. Bird feeding, it can get very addictive. Does anybody have any questions for me? So if you'd like to ask Caitlin questions, you can unmute yourself to do that, or you can put it in the chat and I will relay the question to her. No questions? I, I do have a have question. Have something. Okay. How do I keep like the crows out of my habitat area? 
Crows are one of the smartest birds. And if there's a roosting spot that they prefer it every year, it is difficult. Um, there are universities like uh, Iowa State is where I went to college. They have the third highest crow roosting spot in the nation. And they've done everything from sirens to little tiny nails on buildings to prevent them from roosting and nothing is working. So unfortunately, I don't have a strong suggestion for you because everybody that has them battles and nobody wins. Caitlin, do you have a list uh, in, in print of all the resources and books you recommended today? Um, I was trying to take notes and I can go back and look at the slides. I thought I would share that with everyone, but if you've already got something in print that you could send to me and I could just share, that would be great. Yeah, I can, cre I can create one. Um, I have like uh, lists of typical birds that you would see in the Midwest too can kind of get you a start for a life list. If you want to look at that, I can send that over to you and you could forward it to all the participants as well. That would be nice. Okay, here's a question in chat. I currently have a female cardinal pecking at my window from a nearby tree with a feeder. What kind of window cling will most likely deter the cardinal? So is she pecking at your window now? Yes, yes. Okay, so yeah, uh, with it being breeding season, birds are extremely territorial and they they perform a lot. Uh, cardinals are birds that like a lot of attention. So what that cardinal is most likely doing is it's seeing itself in the window and it's saying like trying to figure out who this species or who this other bird is. Um, so we had the same problem at the nature center uh, actually with a cardinal as well. Um, and we put window clings that are reflective up the other day. Um, so they're kind of shimmery. So when the sun hits them, they kind of look like they move a little bit more than just using a plain black one. Um, so it's like a slightly reflective paper that we just cut out the silhouette on top of. And that seemed to kick it. I don't know if it was the bright light and the reflection. But she, seemed, she seemed to notice that her reflection wasn't a real bird. So I would recommend getting something that looks a little bit more like it could move. Um, and it doesn't have to be actual moving, but a reflective bright colored paper seems to work really good. Very helpful. Thank you. The apps that you mentioned, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yep, I can. Okay, the apps that you mentioned, do some of them have like um, the bird call recognition on it? So Merlin Bird app does. Okay. And, it, it, and it, honestly, it works 40% okay. of the time, but okay. it sometimes does. Okay. And it, I also should mention guys, if you have, grandkids or kids and you're looking for a different type of gift, there is this, I should have put it on there, but I didn't. Um, it's called Identifier. Uh, and it looks like a phone sort of. And you have these little cards that you can slide in and it has a little microchip and you can push a button. Like I could push a button of a song sparrow and it would emit the, the call of a song sparrow. And I could push the button of a wood duck and it could emit the song of a wood duck. And there's different cards that you can put in. There's even one for frog calls now, which would be really great this time of year as frogs are just starting to call. But you can get Midwest specific bird packs. You can get um, owls, you can get raptors, you can get songbirds, you can get ducks and slide those cards in. And it has all the fairly common birds. So if you have a, a kid or a grandkid and they just wanna be able to associate the, the look of a bird and then just play the call, uh, it's a it's a really, really great tool. You can just get it on Amazon. We have it and we bring it out to almost all of our field trips. And some of the more feistier birds like um, red-bellied woodpeckers, for instance, if I play the call on the identifier, the red-bellied woodpecker typically comes to a tree right next to us with a group of like 30 preschoolers. Um, so it's really, really cool to use something like that if you wanted to. Uh, and if you look at the Dubuque County Facebook page or the Dubuque County website. I think I'll get him on there next week. Um, we have a guy coming to town who he's actually a part of a grant program and his presentations are called um, Building Better Birders. This is his third time. His first time he brought a bunch of big raptors. He does really cool bird presentations and he can mimic the bird calls with his mouth and call in birds and they'll just walk right up to him. Uh, like woodcocks is, are doing really cool dances right now where they kind of spin up in the air and do this mating dance and make a funky call, he can call in woodcocks, woodcocks with his mouth. 
Um, so if you want to join in on any of those, we're having one. If you're if you're an early morning person, which if you aren't, you will become one if you like birding. But uh, we're doing bird walks at John Deere Marsh, which is a really, really popular birding area. Probably the best one, I would say, in Dubuque County, right on the Mississippi, right behind the John Deere plant, um, where there's tons of migrant birds that are coming into there. He's coming in there. I think it's like the end of April, which I could get you that date if you wanted it. And he will actually lead the hike and call in birds. So it's it's a really fun thing to be a part of. And occasionally we do bird banding projects where we'll have a professor from UD come out to the nature center. He'll set up a huge mist net by our bird feeders. And then the birds will fly into it basically and drop into the net. And you get to help take it out and you get to put a band, which is essentially just like a ring on its foot with numbers and letters that'll help scientists determine where these birds are going and how far they're flying. So we have that often at Swiss Valley or the Mines of Spain, and you can come out and join on any of those too and bring kids and grandkids because it's really cool to be able to like hold on to a finch or something like that. Does so anybody Caitlin, else have any questions? Caitlin, um, what what is your um, HR? What is your website to go to to find more of those information? Can you write that on your screen like you did your name? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's Dubuque County, Iowa.gov. Sorry, my handwriting is total garbage. But if you go to that page and you click on conservation, you should be able to find a calendar of events. But <laughs> I'm a biology major and I'm the one that controls the website. So it's pretty awful. So if you wanna see the most accurate and you don't have a Facebook, you could email me. Um, every so often I try to figure out the county website and I usually get it, but it just takes a while and it's not probably the most updated. But if you look on our Facebook page, I get Facebook really quickly, so I know how to update that one. And that's just Dubuque County um, Conservation is our Facebook page. You could just put it in your Facebook browser and click following, not just like, so then you'll see all of our posts. Or you can shoot me an email and say like, hey, can you tell me about these bird programs you have coming up? And then I will be able to help you out that way as well. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, before you guys go, um, the last thing that you should do, <laughs> again, if you if you want to check it out or you have grandkids or kids, go on YouTube and Google Dubuque County Courthouse Paragon Falcons. So you've all heard about the Decor Eagle Cam, and that's really great. That's cool. But we have Paragon Falcons right on our courthouse. We set up a nesting box, and this is their fourth year in a row that they've nested. The um, couple have come back, the Peregrine Falcons, and they're scouting it out now. There should be eggs any day, and somewhere at the end of May, they should hatch out. And Peregrine Falcons are the fastest animal in the world. So when most kids or most teachers tell you like, oh, the cheetah is, not really. The Peregrine Falcon can do a steep dive. It was literally clocked by somebody who scuba, or who, uh, oh geez, not scuba dived, parachuted, is that the right thing? Down out of a plane, and they clocked it going over 250 miles an hour. A bird. So peregrine falcons are way cooler than the bald eagles. And we have them right here locally, and you can watch them on a live camera. So again, you can watch them have their eggs. You can watch them incubate them. You can watch them hatch out. And then we crazily crawl up onto the courthouse somewhere in like June or July, and we band the peregrine falcons. And then when they fly away, we'll be able to tell if they come back, they'll have that band that I'll be able to identify them. So you should definitely watch that on YouTube as well. Just YouTube, Dubuque County Courthouse Paragon Falcon. So Caitlin, that brings up a question. I I'm part of another group and somebody in that group keeps saying that Peregrine Falcons are also known as chicken hawks. Is that correct? I have heard Cooper's hawks referred to as chicken hawks. I have never heard Peregrine Falcons referred to as chicken hawks. Thank you. The, the peregrine falcon thing is fun because I bring it up sometimes on field trips when we have a bunch of people come to Swiss Valley and you never know what you're going to get. Like I'll open up the YouTube link and all of a sudden there'll be like a peregrine falcon that's taking apart a pigeon and feeding it to their babies and dropping feathers on the police cars below. And 
sometimes it's really gruesome, but sometimes it's really cute when you see the, the chicks trying to walk around. And sometimes when they begin to get their flight feathers, they jump out and then they walk the ledge of the courthouse. And then they sometimes can't figure out how to get back. And, oh, yeah, it's, it's a it's a fun thing to be able to watch. And considering that we have it locally right here, it's, it's really, really fun. Okay, the last thing, and then I will go. Um, we also have a woodcock watch and owl prowl. I think it's the first weekend in April. I can get it for you really quick. Um, but that one is at Whitewater Canyon. And if you want it, it's April 9th um, at 7 p.m. That one is really, really fun because it's at Whitewater Canyon and we have a, a guy coming in that's a really, really great birder who has this big burly owl call and he will be able to call in owls. And as we're calling owls and walking around, usually the timing works out just right that you'll be able to see those woodcocks, which look like that little volleyballs with a really long beak doing their little goofy call and doing their dance up into the air. It's called a timber doodle actually is their dance. So if you wanted to, you could attend that event too, and you could start to see some beginning parts of birding and then meet other birders as well. But if there are no further questions, I would encourage you to again, write my email down and then look at our website or our Facebook page. If you determine you have any questions, feel free to reach out. And like I said, if I can't answer your question right away, I should be able to put you in touch with somebody who can. Um, and then I would encourage you to attend any of our events. If you're starting to get into dabbling on birding, it's super fun and like I said really addictive so thank you very much for registering for this program today I'm glad you guys were able to join me on this rainy gloomy ish day but hopefully you're able to start seeing some cool birds I have on my bird feeders already started to see some pretty cool stuff so thank you very much for your time